So we are in John chapter 10 this morning. We are in, we're up to the 21st verse, so we're halfway through. And uh, we are well into Jesus' ministry in this point of the book, well into Jesus' ministry. Uh, it's been a, there's been a few trips back and forth as Jesus has gone up to Jerusalem and then gone to Galilee and back and forth. And Jesus has performed several miracles on the, around, and especially at Jerusalem. He performed at least two miracles at Jerusalem itself uh, with, uh, or near Jerusalem. Hang on, I'm getting confused. He's performed some miracles at Jerusalem. Some of the amazing miracles that he's performed is uh, healing a disabled man uh, who couldn't walk, uh, healing a, a man who was born blind, who couldn't see, and feeding 5,000 people in the wilderness, feeding the multitude in the wilderness. But Jesus has been butting heads with the religious elite. He's had his popularity grow and wane depending on his teaching, whether or not people are liking what he's saying. And Jesus has proclaimed time and time again how he is the fulfillment of prophecy, fulfillment of what they were expecting from the Old Testament. He was the expected Christ. And I don't know if you've noticed, but each Sunday that we've been working through John, the title of the sermon has, had, has been the fulfillment of something. It has been something about Jesus' identity that is revealed in the passage. And this week, something that's revealed about the identity of Jesus is this, that he's the Son of God, the Son of God. Last week, it was the Good Shepherd. Jesus is the Good Shepherd of the flock, which is the church, and he lays down his life to secure the flock. And this passage flows on from that. It's got a similar theme in that the idea of shepherds and flocks continues on, but it's a different time, it's a different occasion to the previous passage. And it gives way to one of the most important things that John's gospel has to tell us. And that is, Jesus and the Father are one. They are united. And it's a crazy thing for a human being to say. But Jesus brings the receipts. He can pick up his claim and back it up. And so we're going to work our way through this interesting passage. But I have to forewarn you, we're going to run up against two contentious doctrines in one morning. Two contentions, doctrines in one morning. Now, don't be afraid of the word doctrine. It just means teaching. It's teaching. So, uh, we're going to run up against these two teachings. It's a, these are biblical things. and We want to have good doctrine. We want to know what Jesus has to teach us. And so, with that, we're going to look at this passage and we're going to see what I've summarized as three natures and two responses. Three natures and two responses. The first nature that Jesus talks about is the nature of his of the non sheep, the non sheep, the sheep that don't belong to Jesus, or the, the the ones who aren't part of his flock. Jesus addresses his opponents. Let Let's look at the setting, and we'll see what people are saying. And I'm using the ESV uh, today because it's just better for this passage. Uh, so I'm going to look from verse 22. And uh, Shane, if I could just call on you to uh, take over there. We're looking at verse 22 in, the, in John 10. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So, so Jesus had been up at the tabernacle. Jesus has been up at the tab Feast of Tabernacles, and now he's back for the Feast of Dedication. Uh, now, this feast isn't one of the big feasts that you might remember from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. This, the Feast of Dedication is something different. It's something that the Jews, in later period, after their exile, after the Maccabean Wars, they have this feast where they remember the rededication of the Temple. Because uh, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. Don't, there's not going to be a test. I don't expect you to remember his name. But Antiochus Epiphanes IV had desecrated God's temple. And then they had rededicated the temple and they had a yearly celebration in, at the end of the year to remember the rededication of the temple and thank God. And you might know it by its name, Hanukkah. So Jesus is up at the temple for this celebration. And... Uh, He's, he's there, he's hanging out in the covered areas around the temple. There was an area called Solomon's Colonnade. 
And these are areas made ideal spots to congregate, to teach. Now, you know, this is long before the days of uh, public halls like we have here that we're meeting in today or parks or other kind of public spaces. So for the Jewish people whose faith and life was so centered around the temple, their public space was basically the bit around the temple where they could meet, could have classes, get together. So Jesus is hanging out there. He's probably teaching a crowd of people who want to hear what he has to say. At the very least, he's probably teaching his disciples. And some Jews come along and they want to know, are you the Christ? Stop keeping us in suspense. And now every time Jesus has come to the temple, there's been some commotion or controversy, whether it was driving out the money changers or or healing a man on the Sabbath or or saying something that just really uh, annoyed people, got them offended. And so they were sick of the dancing around the subject in their minds. They want to ask point blank. They want to get the answer straight. Are you the Messiah we've been waiting for? How does Jesus answer this question? In the next verse, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. So basically, Jesus is correcting their misconception. He's already been telling them, I told you already. He's been telling them for ages. Every time Jesus is recorded interacting with people in John, he's proving his point that he's the Messiah. It's, he's told them time and time again. And now it's not like the, uh, the cliche wife who's been dropping hints about what she wanted for her birthday and then... Uh, when she didn't get what she wanted, she was upset and the husband's just oblivious because he didn't pick up any of the hints. This isn't Jesus dropping kind of subtle hints and hoping that they'll pick it up. Jesus has been very deliberate in the way that he has communicated who he is. Jesus has told them again and again. But not only has Jesus told them, he's shown them. He's shown them with with signs like opening the eyes of the blind, which is only something that God does, like feeding the multitude with bread from heaven, like they did in the Exodus, like making the lame walk, bringing forth the new wine of the messianic age. But there's a deeper problem here. Even though Jesus has told them, even though Jesus has shown them the signs, they do not believe because they are not part of Jesus' flock. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. There is a link here between belief and belonging to Jesus. And this is that first doctrine that causes people consternation. It's right here and it's fleshed out a bit more in in the next part of the passage. But we have to deal with this as Jesus presents it. You do not believe because you're not part of my sheep. Even though his words and his works are there, plain as day, the Jews cannot believe because they are not Jesus' sheep. They are not part of the flock. This is not something that they have control over at the end of the day. They're excluded. And this might affect your attitude to thinking about the world and and, and especially about thinking about evangelism. You might think, well, if there are people that I meet who are not part of Jesus' flock and never will be, why evangelize them? Well, here's the thing, Jesus knows, but you don't. You're not Jesus, you don't know who's part of his flock or who will become part of his flock, so to speak. You don't know. You do know what God has told you to do, which is to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. Jesus has told us what to do, we go into the world and we do what he's told us to do, proclaiming that good news. We've been told what to do. We haven't been told who is part of the flock and who isn't. We know that there will be many people who reject this good news despite the evidence and the words. Our gospel proclamation will be their condemnation. But that's our job, to proclaim the good news to the whole creation. It's not our job to figure out whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We are only to go and share the gospel, proclaim it, to make disciples. But Jesus does know. Jesus knows who's in and who's out. He knows the ones who are not part of the flock, who do not believe the words, who do not believe the signs. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. 
But there are some who do believe. There are some who, who will believe. And they are the sheep. And, but what are the sheep like? Well, we get the nature of the sheep in the next verses. The nature of the sheep. So Jesus turns straight from describing those who are not his sheep to describing those who are his sheep. And, and look at this. In this opening verse here, we get three kind of reciprocal uh, things going on, three parallels. So Jesus describes they, the sheep, and I, or what he will do. So what the sheep are like and what he does. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. See that beautiful reciprocal thing going on there with what Jesus is doing, what he's accomplishing and how the sheep respond? Let's look at each of those, those reciprocal things in, a t in turn. So there's the three reciprocal things there. First, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. This is opposed to those who are not Jesus' sheep. Jesus' sheep hear his voice. They receive the words of Christ. They believe where the others remain in the sin of unbelief. This is not because one group is uh, some, somehow qualitatively better than the other. This is because of what God is doing and has done in people. These are the one whom Jesus knows. They hear and Jesus knows them. And this isn't just in the sense that Jesus knows about them or Jesus knows what they will do in the future. He does know those things. But this is the choosing knowledge that we see throughout the scriptures. From Genesis all the way through the Bible, God knows his people. God knows his people. He knows those who belong to him. He knows those whom he will call and bring into his fold. He knows his sheep in a way that is different to all those who will reject him. He knows everything about all of those Jews who will reject him, but he does not know them relationally and covenantally. But as for the sheep, Jesus knows them by name. But in this second reciprocal thing going on here, we've got they, the sheep, the sheep follow me and I give them eternal life. The sheep follow me, I give them eternal life. Those whom Jesus knows, they follow him, they hear, he knows, they follow. They will not listen to the voices of others calling them away to danger and destruction. But they will follow the sound of Jesus. But where does Jesus lead the sheep? He leads them to eternal life. I give them eternal life. As they follow, they are given eternal life by Jesus. He is the gracious king, the gracious Messiah who will lead his, fl lead his flock to a place like no other. You will not find life in any other name on earth. All other masters are deceivers and swindlers who will cheat you out of your life. There is only one flock and there is only one shepherd who will make you lie down in green pastures and lead you beside still waters. In this third reciprocal thing going on there, we get the, they will never perish, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Those who are given eternal life surprisingly enough, will never perish. They have heard the voice, they followed him, and so they never die. Now, I, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a TV show. Uh, I'm not going to give it away but in case you ever want to watch it. It's a bit, a bit hit and miss. But it deals with some philosoph philosophy ideas about the afterlife and about ethics and about good and evil. And in the end, one of the things that this show kind of gets to is that they basically get to this point where they believe or they put forward this idea that the ideal eternal life, the ideal life uh, forever, immortality, has the option to opt out, essentially like a heavenly euthanasia. Once you've lived for etern in eternity for as long as you like um, and fill fulfilled all of your pleasures and dreams and desires, then you can basically opt out and perish, be no more. But this isn't the kind of eternal life that we're looking forward to, where, you know, like on earth, 
you might have the passion, something that you love doing, but after you've done it for a while, you kind of grow bored with it and you move on to something else. But this isn't the kind of eternal life that is held out for us, something where we kind of get bored of it after a little while and then hop on to try something new or when we've just grown tired of it all, just opt out. This is, this is eternal life. This is goodness. This is goodness forevermore. This is a life that is worth living for eternity. That should never have an end. And Jesus has that for his sheep. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of his hand. There is nobody who can, who can do it. Even ourselves. We cannot, we cannot undo God's uh, eternal life that he gives. They are safe and secure. Even, now, even the devil is an adversary to Jesus. He is trying to snatch God's people out of his hand. But we don't need to fear. No one will snatch them out of his hand. For sure, the devil is an adversary to God. But it's like, um, it's like Tuvalu trying to conquer China. 10,000 people trying to conquer billions. Like, it's just completely uh, out of whack. There's no way that this could work. There is no way that the devil could ever overcome God or outdo God or conquer him. God is ruler, even though the devil is running around trying to undermine that. No one can snatch them out of his hand. And Jesus doubles down on this by saying, not only can they not snatch, can God's flock not be snatched out of my hand, they can't be snatched out of the Father's hand. In verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So God the Father is greater than any enemy that could possibly assault them. And no one can snatch the sheep from him. Just as no one can snatch the sheep from Jesus. You can't snatch the sheep from Jesus and the Father. The world can't. Satan can't. Demons can't. Sin can't. Even bad theology can't snatch you away from Jesus. But did you notice the other thing in this passage here, the other interesting thing here? It says the Father has given the sheep to Jesus. The Father has given them to me. The Father gave the flock to Jesus. The flock didn't give themselves to Jesus. God the Father gave the flock to Jesus. This means there is something going on here in the, un, in the, in, in the heavenlies. There's something going on here with God. There's something going on beyond our lived experience, where God is in operation, giving his flock to Jesus. It causes the flock to believe, to be saved and be secure. God the Father has given the flock to the Son for him to save and secure. And, and this is a huge relief. It's such an encouragement to know that no one can snatch the flock out of the Father's hand, the Son's hand, and... God is on operation, giving the flock to the Son. My position as a member of Jesus' flock is not dependent on me. And if it was, I would mess it up. That's for sure. Instead, we are left to look to God the Father in thankful wonder. We are left to look to Jesus. We're left beholding him and glorifying him and honoring him not worrying about my own position and whether i've done enough we're looking to him for our security and peace not to ourselves we're looking to god to provide and not to ourselves to measure up and you might ask then well if it's all of god then why do i bother doing anything well because if it's all of god he accomplishes his work in and through you as you respond to him. What you do in response is God at work, building and growing you. It's not for you to just throw up your hands and say, oh, God will sort it out. God sorts it out by you getting off your backside and doing something. It's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose which is what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Yes, it's all God's doing that you are saved. It's all God's doing that he grows your faith, but you will never lose that secure position with him, but he does it in you. He accomplishes something 
in you. There is change. There is repentance. There is growth in godliness. God achieves your eternal security by warning you about falling away from the faith, by spurring you on to eternal life. And we know that there will be a great many who fall away, but we take solace from the fact that the sheep are secure. They never will fall away. They hear the voice of the shepherd. They are secure. They never perish. John makes a comment about this in in 1 John chapter 2. He's talking about those who are against Christ. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all uh, not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. You need not fear that God will forget about you or toss you aside or reject your application. He has his sheep and Jesus has saved them. It's a done deal. It can't be retroactively changed. This is encouraging. But if you are walking in unrepentant sin you have reason to doubt whether or not you're part of God's flock. When Jesus saves his people, the Holy Spirit enters in and starts to change them from the inside out. You will know a tree by its fruit. If it's not bearing good fruit, then you have to ask the question, what kind of tree is it? We expect to see Jesus' flock turning away from sin as they are convicted of it. If you are not turning away from your sin, you have to ask that hard question. Am I the one rejecting the word of Jesus? Have I actually entered through the sheep gate or have I jumped the fence and I'm pretending to be a sheep when I'm not really? Are you the seed sown among the weeds that is having your faith choked out by the world? What if the answer is yes? Based on what you can see, the evidence before your eyes looks like you're outside the flock. This should inspire terror in your heart. You should feel the grave weight of your sin resting on your shoulders. You must remember that the great day of the Lord looms on the horizon and he is ready to call you to account. Fly, you fool. Fly to your Savior and throw yourself on the mercy of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Repent your sins and call on the name of the Lord that you may be saved. Be cleansed of your iniquities by the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for you. What good is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins unless you would be plunged beneath that flood and wash all your sins away? Turn to the loving good shepherd and hear his voice. He's calling you out of the world. He's calling you out of your depravity. He's calling you out of your wayward wickedness. And Jesus' sheep will hear his voice and follow him. They will not perish. They will be secure with Christ. The third nature that Jesus talks about is his own nature, the nature of the Christ. Jesus turns from describing what his sheep are like. He's told them that he's the Christ. They won't believe because they're not part of the flock. He tells them what the flock is like. And now he wants to talk about the leader of the flock. Oops. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. Of which of them are you going to stone me? And Jesus answered, the Jews answered him, It's not good, not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. I and the Father are one. And this is the only way that it makes sense that the flock are secure with Jesus' hands because they are with the Father's hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of Jesus' hand. And Jesus is making a claim to be divinely intertwined with God the Father. Not only is Jesus a mouthpiece for God, a prophet, 
but he is actively doing God-like work. He's doing God's work in the world. They're so closely connected that they are one. Two persons unified on mission in mindset and power. Jesus is making a claim of godhood. And that's why the Jews wanted to stone him. They thought he was being blasphemous. They're livid. They try to take matters into their own hands and deal with what they think is a wicked blasphemer. They want to purge Jesus from their midst by taking his life. They have a healthy respect for God's name. They don't want God to be blasphemed, but they, uh, they have a mis- it's misplaced here. Misplaced to pick up stones to kill Jesus. But Jesus asks a pertinent question that gets the Jews to face the problem that we saw back in chapter 9. The miraculous works can't come from any other source than God, so how can you write off Jesus as not coming from God? How can Jesus be sprouting falsehoods on the one hand, but doing God's will and work on the other? He says, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these will you stone me? But, but these guys brush that aside. They won't be distracted. Essentially saying, good works or not, you're being blasphemous by equating yourself with God. And then Jesus pulls out a master stroke. And I know we're going to be going a bit longer here this morning, but I hope you can, you can follow along because this is important. Jesus pulls out this master stroke and he says, look at your own Bible. It tells you that there are some folks called gods. Don't you believe God's word? He says, if, someone is, if God calls someone a god in the Old Testament, why should the Jews get upset with Jesus using the same language that God uses? Now, this requires a bit of work, so let's suss this next part out. This is this next contentious doctrine that I was telling you we were going to rush rush up against this morning. Jesus answered them in verse 34, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? So so here Jesus is referring to Psalm 82, which we looked at before, which we read earlier. It's a psalm that puzzles some people, namely because of this language about gods. And and we Christians, we are monotheists. We believe and worship the one true God. We don't have a pantheon of gods that that all are vying for our worship. Uh, Nor are we tritheists. We believe that Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is one God in three persons. One God, not three. But you might be surprised to hear that the Bible talks about other spiritual beings as gods. Like in English, the word God is not exclusive to one person or one, cat, one, uh, one being. We can use the word gods and we know that we're talking about other gods. Usually we're talking about other false gods, pretend uh, gods, gods of the other religions. But... In Hebrew, it's the same, it's a similar thing. The, the word God is not exclusive to God. It is used, it's, it's like the word human. It's a word that describes something rather than referring to a specific person. And so in Hebrew, the word is Elohim. It's, it's a description, not a name. So if I were to talk to you about the Father, you would immediately understand that I'm talking about a preeminent father, in our case, God the Father. But that does not mean that there are not other fathers. There are, but they pale in comparison to the Father. And the same with the word gods. There's the capital G God, the God, the Most High, the one we worship. And there are other spiritual beings, sometimes called gods, lowercase g, who pale in comparison to the God. And that's why God gives a personal name for himself. That's why God reveals himself as uh, what is written in your English Bibles as the Lord, which is the, the, what is, we believe is pronounced Yahweh, the personal name of God, so that God may be known distinctly and not confused with other spiritual beings. And the Bible helps us out with these distinctions by usually talking about the other Elohim as sons of God. And this is exactly what's happening in Psalm 82. 
he talks about the Elohim who judges the Elohim, who which are later to clarified to be the sons of Elohim. So if you want to quickly flip in your Bibles to Psalm 82, or we'll put it up on the screen here. It says, Elohim has taken his place in the divine council, and in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. So, um, we're doing lots, we're covering lots of ground here this morning. We're told in Deuteronomy 32 that God has divided the nations up in accordance with the number of the sons of God. They were divided up, God handed over the other nations to be looked after by these spiritual beings, but the Lord chose Israel for himself as his cherished possession. And God one day planned to reclaim the nations through Jesus Christ, but before that day, we get Psalm 82, where there's this scene of God judging the sons of God. The God is holding the sons of God to account for their actions, their mismanagement of the other nations. So, the Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. And then a little further down, if you could put the next slide up. I said, you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So all the stuff about God's judgment here is a topic for another day. But we need to hone in here on what Jesus is picking up from this passage. He says, the God says to these beings, you are gods, sons of the Most High. And Jesus is putting this front and center with the Jews, essentially saying, if God called other, other beings gods, what's, what's the problem with me calling myself the sons of, son of God? God did it. It's in the Bible. If God called these guys gods, and if God spoke to them, and the Bible is true, then there's a clear precedent for calling someone God and God sending his word to them. Jesus is saying, that's what I'm doing. I'm calling God my father. I'm one of the sons of God. And God has sent his word to me. Jesus is claiming to be such a one, him who the father consecrated and sent into the world. So how can they charge Jesus with blasphemy if he's only doing what God has done before? But Jesus says, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at the evidence in John 10, 37. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Jesus has been doing things that prove the truth. These are the fruit. You'll know the, the tree by the fruit. And you can see it in Jesus. But not only is Jesus uh, one of the sons of God in this kind of council, this council of divine gods, uh, sorry, this divine council of gods, Jesus is one with the Father. Jesus is not just a God, but he is the God. Jesus is essentially claiming to be the one judging the divine council. He's the one who is ruling and reigning over all things in heaven and on earth. The nature of Jesus is that he is God. He is the son on mission from the father. He's doing the works and the signs that are true to his identity. Everybody should believe in him. But even though everybody should believe in him, we already know what's going to happen. We know that there's going to be two responses. And this is the last thing we're looking at this morning. These two responses. Only some will believe. Jesus is inherently divisive. He forces people to pick a side. Even if they're apathetic, apath apathy is still picking a side. It's picking a side which is not Jesus' side. In this case, however, Jesus has opponents who aren't apathetic, but they actually try to actively take Jesus out. In verse 39, they tried to seize him, but they escaped. he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him, and they said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. So, it was not Jesus' time to be arrested. He avoided being arrested once more. But that day was still coming. 
while Jesus escaped, he would head back to his old ministry turf and he runs into other people who are putting the pieces together about who he is as the Messiah. So we have these two responses laid out for us starkly here. Those who will pick up stones to stone him or try and arrest him and those who would believe in him. Those who uh, are not content merely to say, no thanks, I don't want that, but they're actively trying to take steps to remove Jesus from the world. And we see people like that in our own day, people who want to reject Jesus. The God that they don't believe in, they are vehemently hate him. They want to remove him. They want to purge him from our modern society. But there are others, and they show a good response. They show a good response. They come to Jesus, they see the signs, they hear the word, and they believe him. They're putting the pieces together. They're the ones who Jesus was talking about, his flock. His flock. Now, we don't know the depth of faith of these people who believe in Jesus, but as we approach this transitional section of the book of John, it's interesting to see this group of people who are believers. The earlier chapters of John seem... um, the earlier chapters of John have believers that are kind of half-hearted. They, they fall away. But here we have believers who seem to be genuine. These seem to be the ones that come uh, to fulfill what John said in John 1 verse 12, which is, All who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. These are part of his flock. And so I want to part with you asking the question, are you going to be part of this flock? What is your response going to be? Is your response going to be rejection? I won't have any of Jesus, thank you very much. Or worse, are you going to actively try and suppress the name of Jesus, um, discredit him, try and get rid of him? Or are you going to be those who hear his voice, respond to what he says, follow after him and find security and peace with him? One way is the way to perishing. One way is the way to stay under God's wrath. And the other way is the escape. The other way is the path to eternal life in fullness of forgiveness and freedom. Which way will will it be? Which response will you have to Jesus? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who is one with you. We thank you, Lord, for the way that he has rescued his sheep, that he has uh, secured them, that he will give them eternal life. We thank you, Lord, that those who are secure with you will never perish. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a right way, a view of ourselves that we would be able to see clearly whether we are standing against you and opposed to you or whether we are secure and resting in what you have done for us. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, draw into your flock all those whom you already know that are part of your flock. Lord, we know that your your flock, uh, that that those who are part of your flock are secure. And so we, we pray, Lord, that we would see those who have not yet called on your name, call on your name and find their place in your flock. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to take this good news out into the world, to see other people hear the Good Shepherd, to hear his voice coming from our lips so that they might know him and follow him and never perish. Thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Those who belong to Jesus, who are part of his flock, they eat his flesh and drink his blood, as we're told earlier in John. So that's what we're going to do now, and to partake of Jesus as a remembrance of what he did for his flock. He laid down his life. His body was broken, like I'm going to break this loaf of bread. His blood was shed.